All right. So I'm going to let you get started uh, with your talk, which is about Corona Net. That sounds interesting. Right. So welcome to my talk, Corona Net: Fighting COVID-19 with Computer Vision. So uh, before we begin, I guess um, a little self intro. I am a 17-year-old um, student from Hong Kong. I'm really interested in computer vision, specifically generative models, as well as um, scientific computing, especially um, modeling partial differential equations with neural networks. Um, so um, a, a brief intro about like the background of this project, why I came to pursue it. It's because I, I started this project in uh, approximately late February uh, to early March. I was very much inspired by the doctors from Wuhan, which I saw for, on TV, and how they were working like 72 hours straight to battle the virus and keep everyone safe. And I was thinking possibly um, there was something we could do as um, more technical people to maybe help them out. So this is how I got the inspiration for CoronaNet. I was also very much inspired by the Johns Hopkins University. Um, they showed me that um, we can leverage technology to help battle the pandemic. And so I wanted to like do my part as well. Um, so they created the COVID dashboard, which was very helpful to a lot of people globally. So um, yes, regarding the background, I had also pre I have also previously done a, a project on brain tumor boundary resection for lower grade glioma, and it also involved um, um, segmentation. So I was thinking per, uh, perhaps we could transfer that experience and um, to help out with the coronavirus. So um, here's my problem statement, which is uh, basically how I would like to help um, with the problem. So um, we see that hospitals all around the world are overwhelmed with COVID-19 patients and there aren't en enough doctors nor equipment to like go around. So um, we can see that there is a manpower shortage as in uh, doctors. Um, there aren't enough doctors to attend to all of the patients and all of the scans from the CT images. And uh, because um, mostly radiologists are, are the most knowledgeable about these uh, scans and there aren't a lot of them. And also a, a supply shortage as in um, ventilators uh, need to be reserved for the most vulnerable. So um, I was thinking to automate CT diagnosis confirmation with AI. So um, with this, with CoronaNet, I was hoping to um, automate the diagnosis confirmation as in um, the, the AI can view the CT scan and then um, make a prediction on the probability that the person has uh, the coronavirus. So this can pro possibly help uh, release, relieve the, the labor shortage and to help with um, patient triaging and the allocation of resources because um, by gauging the the extent of segmentation and um, positive pixels, you can know which patient is has the most severe coronavirus. So CoronaNet is made out of like three tasks. Firstly, it's binary classification, which is basically um, zero and one infected or not infect infected with COVID-19. And secondly, would be binary segmentation, which is um, given a CT image, we identify all the all of the pixels which are infected with um, and with a symptom. So symptoms include um, one of three, which are brown glass consolidation and pure effusion. With binary segmentation, we do not differentiate between them. Whereas with three class segmentation, we do differentiate between them, as you can see from the colors. So three class segmentation is obviously the most difficult, which is which accounts for the slightly lower um, accuracy. So um, as this is a, is a Python conference, so let's first go over the technologies we used, I used. Um, so um, the language is obviously Python and I utilized the NumPy library. Uh, for AI, I used um, PyTorch and um, I also used Albumentations, TorchVision, Scikit-Image and Matplotlib for image processing. So why NumPy? Because um, NumPy speed is um, very, it, NumPy is very fast compared with compared with um, vanilla Python because it utilizes techniques such as parallelism and vectorization. So it also has better support for matrices, tensors, and operation and math operations. So that's very useful when you're dealing with AI. It also retains the benefits of Python itself, which are, um, for example, elegant syntax. So um, what 
you might ask, what do you use for image processing? So I think matplotlib, um, how, how I compare them would be matplotlib is like more general purpose. It has some really good functions. Um, it works very well for say, saving and loading an image, whereas scikit-image has more advanced algorithms such as um, optical flow. So, and also PyTorch vision, is it's very tightly integrated with PyTorch. So it's very ideal to use when you're doing augmentations in the data loader with PyTorch. Lastly, augmentations is specific, specifically for biomedical imaging. So it has functions such as scale shift and elastic deformations, which are very useful for biomedical imaging. And why PyTorch? Uh, well, firstly, it's, it has more research support, as in most papers, um, most SOTA papers, they release code in PyTorch. So if you want to integrate like the most updated technology into your code, PyTorch would be more ideal. It also offers more customization ability. And I, I heard that TensorFlow gets a little bit tedious with um, data loaders um, from my friends. And also it has, it was des designed with dynamism in mind. So it offers dynamic computation graphs. And I heard that TensorFlow 2 also has this, but well, I, I stick with PyTorch. So in terms of the model architecture used, um, so my consideration is that for my task, I'm tackling multi-label segmentation. So as a brief overview, in computer vision, there are three main tasks, which are respectively classification, detection, and segmentation. So in classification, so normally classification is considered the most easy. Um, in classification, you basically given an input image, you output a single scalar label representing the class of the object in the image. So for example, if I had um, an image of a car, then you would possibly output the number of five and five would correspond to the class of car. For detection, you're not only concerned about the scalar label, you're also concerned about some degree of um, location information. So you would have to identify the, uh, the boundaries of the object of interest so that you can output a, a bounding box um, around the, the object. And lastly, for segmentation, it's considered the most challenging. So given an input image, you not only have to um, retain spatial and semantic information, you also need to perform sort of pixel-wise classification so that um, you can identify the whole extent of the image um, and output a pixel-wise mask. So firstly, let's go over um, the techniques for classification. So um, as, as you can see, given an input image, you output a class label. This is typically done with the fully connected layer. Um, vanilla convolutional neural networks already perform fairly well in this task. But then when you, people, when, when you were trying to um, obtain really high accuracy, you turn to deep CNNs. However, um, researchers in the past found that there was an accuracy saturation and degradation problem because, um, because of difficulties in identi identity mapping. So they introduced um, the, the, the improvement of ResNets um, to help with identity mapping as well as feature pyramid networks. So ResNet, ResNets are basically introduced this um, shortcut connection to relieve the pressure from added layers when identity mapping. Whereas in FPNs, they have this lateral top-down hierarchical um, connection structure. So um, basically, you combine the feature maps at different scales so that you can retain um, hierarchical um, information from different scales so that you don't lose. Um, so, so in conventional CNNs, when you um, perform, when you perform increasing um, convolutional layers, you lose some you sacrifice spatial information for semantic information. However, if you do this um, lateral top-down thing um, and fuse different feature maps at different scales, you can retain this information and make better predictions. So um, in particular, in my in, in CoronaNet, I utilize the efficient net architecture, which is basically um, the SOTA on uh, ImageNet and a few other benchmarks. So it introduces a novel compound scaling method, uh, which completely revolutionizes like the scaling of network depth with an input resolution parameters. So as you can see, um, this is the compound um, scaling method. Um, um, scaling method, and so it basic. Their insight is basically that 
um, death with an resolution, they influence each, each other. So you cannot scale them arbitrarily or individually. So they actually performed um, linear graph search as well as some um, other mechanisms to find the ideal parameters. And so by scaling up, um, uh, so they scale um, up the computational resources um, accordingly by to the power of, um, uh, yeah, to the power of two. Uh, yeah, and um, so you can see um, it's it outperforms a lot of other baselines with um, minimal parameters. So um, this is this pro gives a unique benefit to me because um, I don't have access to a lot of computational resources, but it's also it balances accuracy as well as speed and efficiency. Now moving on to segmentation. So what segmentation is is basically um, as we covered earlier, basically to perform um, pixel wise um, classifications. So, um, so here's a more algorithmic description of what segmentation is. And so I utilize the fully convolutional uh, network, which is basically an encoder decoder model. So um, what what's different about FCNs is basically with conventional CNNs, um, <clears throat> You learn a convolutional function instead of uh, you learn a convolutional function. And if you want to obtain a mask from that function, you would have to implement some additional um, mechanisms such as class activation mapping. So that's an extra step, and it's not it's not ideal. Um, whereas for um, FCNs, you can do it directly by learning a, a convolutional filter. So as you can see from here, this U shape, this is U net. Um, so it downsamples and then upsamples, and then um, it learns this convolutional filter through this encoder decoder network. And in particular, I used the unit um, model, uh, which is um, which basically introduces a symmetrical contracting and expansive path. So you can see that the dimensions are largely symmetrical. Um, also, it computes um, right. Also, it it attained SOTA performance in the SB challenges in 2014 and 2015, I believe. It's also tailored to biomedical imaging and, and it has had a lot of success in that area. And lastly, it's it so basically what the an advantage of the encoder decoder model is that it successfully fuses local and global information. Uh, so that because um it's up some so it's a bit based on uh, the feature pyramid network as well. Um, the principles are similar. Um, and so it retains these uh, the, both global and local information so that it can make um, better, 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 um, well, predictions. So in terms of the data I used, I because this was actually a huge challenge for me at first, because I start a bit early in um, early March. Um, and there wasn't a lot of data out. Actually, there, there actually was no data out except for the COVID-19 CT segmentation data set. So um, this data set is, it's, um, so let's show this. Yes, so when I first started, it only offered 100 axial CT scan slices, which is nowhere near, near enough for um, training AI, as you probably know. Um, but Progressively, they introduced more and more da data, which I am training on. Um, for now, I have, I my training set includes approximately one thousand slices, which is not enough. Um, so, so this means that although CoronaNet has attained a well fairly good performance, it's nowhere near applicable applicable to real life yet. So, if you have data, feel free to, and you're willing to share, like feel free to and contact me, I would love to improve on CoronaNet. So, um, yes. So because of the very limited data set size, so augmentation is very crucial. So um, for better generalization. So in particular, I used elastic transformations and scale shift to simulate the natural deformations of human biological tissue, as well as random cropping, normalization, and random rotations. So let's um, examine the performance of um, CoronaNet. So as you can see, um, I evaluated the performance following convention with friend loss and dice coefficient. And um, 
dice coefficient is basically the ideal is one and um, the worst performance you can get is zero. So um, as you can see in bi binary classification, the network actually performs a lot better um, because it's less a less challenging task. And also because there was more data, a lot more data available for binary classification. And um, this was trained on, um, for binary classification, the model was trained on approximately a data set size of approximately a thousand, whereas for um, multi-class segmentation, it was only trained on like um, 80 images augmented to 1,920. So as you can see, the data set size is a huge problem um, for um, any open source project like CoronaNet. So um, the ideal accuracies were achieved um, using the Adam optimizer, which has, um, well, less, which oscillates less than say SGD. So now in terms of future development, I would love to further pursue a uh, Corona net. Um, so yes. Um, so for, in terms of further development, I would love to um, leverage it to recommend personalized medicine slash treatment, for example, based on the extent of, uh, so based on the number of pixels that were identified as positive um, and infected with um, COVID-19, we could possibly um, use this as a metric to assess the severity and um, and also the severity of COVID-19 in each patient, as well as use the, the exact types of um, the types of um, coronavirus symptoms identified. So, for example, if one person has 80% um, ground glass, perhaps, um, and 20% consolidation, perhaps this could be used as a metric, uh, as a consideration to tailor the medical treatment to each patient. And also um, because of the limited data, data and how um, and how for segmentation, if you're trying, if you you're trying to predict a mask, it's a, the, the data an annotation process is actually very labor intensive because a radiologist has to hand label each pixel. And it's not very ideal because they, they're very busy with the COVID-19 pandemic and everything. So um, I would recommend, uh, I would try to, I would suggest uh, trying a weekly supervised segmentation approach. For example, using global average pooling, um, class activation mapping, or um, object region mining. So this can um, bypass the need for labor intensive mask annotations. So um, lastly, I would like to go over a bit of the code. Um, yes, so this is actually posted in my GitHub repo which is here. Uh, no, right. Uh, let me just find it, sorry. Um, right, it, it's here. Um, perhaps I'll send it, send out the link later in um, the chat. Right, so um, this reports, in this repo I report the accuracies as well, uh, as well as of classification. So as you can see, with efficient net, we obtained, I obtained very good results um, um, in terms of binary classification, which is a less challenging task. And, um, and also, um, so in terms of the code, the data can be downloaded directly from this website. Um, I did some pre-processing, but it should be enough, easily, easy enough to figure out. So, um, CoronaNet. Yes. So, as you can see, I used PyTorch for this task. And um, for you, I used the UNET model um, and I actually included six, six uh, contracting and upsampling paths. Um, as opposed to, as opposed to the um, vanilla model, which had four upsampling and contracting paths. So, um, yes. And a possible improvement for, so um, let's first, let's talk about the possible improvements in terms of accuracy for this um, model would be firstly, um, di including dilation and also, um, and also attention mechanisms to units. Um, so this is a, so briefly to talk about how to use PyTorch. Um, as you can see, um, it's very easy to load the data 
Um, so I wrote a data loader. Um, so this is this is how I loaded the data. So this would be the augmentations that I do. Um, I normalize my images. It's very it's very important to normalize your images in machine learning because um, um, the optimizers they 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 can. It's easier for them to converge when the features are scaled more properly. And yes. So PyTorch also provides a lot of built-in functions, such as um, the binary cross entropy loss, as well as um, uh, as well as the and then not sequential. It, it's a very useful. It's a very useful. Um, it's a very useful function for um, for connecting networks. So let's for, let's have a look at the code. It's all freely. Um, it's all available on GitHub. Yes, so as you can see, you can very easily define um, a network. So um, I basically use um, some UNet blocks, which are defined below. Uh, basically, it's a deep convolutional, a fully convolutional network. Um, if you want um, further information about the code, and feel free to, well, fork the, the repo and try to, like, tinker with it yourself. So here are some references which I um, which I refer to um, in in my work. So um, for example, the ResNet paper and whatnot. So um, if you have any questions about um, CoronaNet, feel free to contact me at my Gmail or um, my socials, I guess. Uh, last but not least, um, so through CoronaNet, my, my aim was to I I I, ended, I ended, identified an opportunity to to basically help um, with a lot of with help with um, the pandemic through technology and I think it's not really um, the capabilities of technology it's not really limited to just biomedical imaging or something like that we can actually help um, the world in a lot of ways through technology so. Another example would be uh, through education. So um, I have actually actually started co-founded uh, an initiative for AI education with my friend, and we are planning to run a contest, um, which uh, which deals with AI education, and we will be using Python uh, primarily. So we are currently recruiting organizations, projects, and mentors. So feel free to um, check us out. Um, the it's included in the EuroPython slides. So last but not least, I hope that through this talk, you learned a bit more about AI techniques and how we can, we as people who know Python can leverage Python libraries and Python, uh, such as PyTorch and NumPy to um, really build a, an open source project that can um, directly help with um, global crises and um, just so that we can try to do our part to help, um, especially in this very trying time. So this is at the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Ted, thank you for that presentation. That was really cool. Thank you.